Welcome to Season 2 of Inflammation Nation. My name is Gronio O'Leary. Inflammation Nation is a podcast from Arthritis Ireland, aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of arthritis and related conditions. Hello and welcome. Today I'm joined by Professor Doug Veal and Louise Moore. Professor Doug Veal is Director of Translational Research at St. Vincent's University Hospital. And he's Director of the ULR Centre of Excellence for Arthritis and Rheumatic Disease. He's an adjunct full clinical professor of medicine and consultant rheumatologist at St. Vincent's University Hospital. Louise Moore is an advanced nurse practitioner based at the Rheumatic Musculoskeletal Disease Unit at Our Lady's Hospice and Care Services in Carol's Cross. Louise provides direct care to patients with complex arthritis related problems. She's completed an MSc in Rheumatology Reproductive Medicine and founded the Innovative Maternal Medicine Rheumatology Clinic with colleagues at the National Maternity Hospital in Hollis Street. You're both very welcome. Delighted to have you here today. Thank you for having us. Thanks very much. So let's jump straight in. Um, you know, look, planning a family is an exciting time mm-hmm. in someone's life. Um, but it's, it's fair to say that there are, you know, some challenges and considerations um, when somebody has arthritis. So maybe let's start at the beginning. Is there is there a best time to plan a pregnancy when you have arthritis? Well, well obviously, the best time to, st- to, to plan a pregnancy is in advance. So we know for a fact that, you know, 50 percent of our pregnancies are unplanned and 50 percent are planned. So we want to sort of increase that number to the, that. Hopefully we would get to a point where most pregnancies are planned. So when you have arthritis, there are considerations that need to be considered. So you medication management, obviously, and then the importance, I suppose, of good disease control. And I suppose that's where we, the planning piece comes, making sure that you're on the right medications and also that your disease is well controlled prior to, to conceiving. Again, it's also an opportunity to look at um, other lifestyle behaviours, which are important for every woman that's planning a pregnancy. So whether that be um, in Proving, you know, you know, uh, your exercise uh, tolerance, uh, 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 reducing smoking or stopping smoking, reducing alcohol intake, all those modifiable health behaviours that we can all, that every woman should do before they, they uh, plan a pregnancy. So that planning piece is really, really important. Also, we also, you know, when we're when planning a pregnancy, you know, get the opportunity to think about you know, are the cervical smears up to date? Is, is cervical screening up to date? Um, have we, uh, uh, are our vaccinations up to date? So, so it is that time where we can um, look at all these things and make sure that you're fit for pregnancy when the, when the time actually comes. So planning cannot be overemphasized. Mm. Uh, the, the philosophy of the Rose Clinic in Hollow Street is, very much that uh, if and you might tell us a little bit about what the Rose Clinic so, is. So the Rose yeah. Clinic is rheumatology obstetric service. So it's really for uh, patients with arthritis who are planning a pregnancy or who find themselves pregnant. And uh, we, we sort of see a lot of patients there who have got problems associated with their disease or indeed with their pregnancy. And it means that they can see a consultant uh, obstetrician as well as consultant rheumatologists at the same time and the nurse specialists and the advanced nurse practitioners like Louise in the one clinic. So all the services that, that they need are there on site. Um, and initially we, we set it up, I guess, for, for, for patients with arthritis who were having problems or experiencing problems with either controlling their disease or were asking questions about their treatment during pregnancy. But the philosophy of the clinic is very much if we have a healthy mum, we're more likely to have a healthy baby. So um, if you plan a pregnancy, you're more likely to maintain your health throughout that pregnancy. And uh, and that's the, the, the main, uh, I guess, you know, driver uh, for us is to actually, you know, focus in on health during pregnancy, before and during pregnancy. And I think that uh, in most cases, it, it it sort of stands to reason that if you're healthy before you conceive or at the time of conception, that you're going to be better able to actually manage that pregnancy as well. Ideally, and, you know, more commonly, we are seeing women coming to the clinic, you know, and, and seeking advice around pregnancy, you know, one or two years before they actually plan pregnancy. But, you know, so it's really women really actually want to have this conversation so that they're on the right track. And it's also, I suppose, an opportunity for women to 
remind their clinicians about treatments that they're on or maybe treatments that they might be changed on. It just keeps it in um, in everybody's uh, thought process that pregnancy might not be happening just now, but it might be coming in a few years time. So it's um, it's it's one or two years is when we would usually see women planning pregnancy. OK, and um, with regards to the dads or the men, because obviously men have arthritis too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and just from my own work in arthritis Ireland, that's something that I've encountered where, you know, uh, men actually overlook kind of the, the fact that they also Their may need to have the conversation. So can you tell me a little bit about that in terms of what 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 a man might need to, you know, where, when he might start that conversation mm. or what approach he might take as well? So, again, there are if, when, it, when we come to talk about our fathers, really, the, the main focus is on medication management. So we do know now there are, you know, and it's very clear and we have uh, new guidelines just after being published in relation to medication management, medications that are compatible with pregnancy um, or for, for men to father a child. Um, so, again, men should be encouraged. And I suppose we as clinicians should remember to ask men of any age of their plans to father children because we might need a medication it might need a medication change so however though in the last 10 years there's been lots of new uh, our, our knowledge base has increased in relation to you know medications that uh, men can continue on now for example metotrexate was a medication that was commonly stopped in our male patients and um, when they were planning pregnancy, whereas now new guidance would say that is, you know, men can continue on these medications. So while we do have to consider our, our male patients, you know, when they're thinking of fathering a children and um, there is, um, I suppose. And I think, Doug, I think you would agree with this, but there are less limitations to medication management when it comes to our male patients. Absolutely. And I think the research has been quite, mm. you know, uh, progressive in that respect that we can actually you know with with some degree of certainty now sort of say that you know look it's okay you can stay on these medications you know um and uh f particularly for men i think it's you know it's it's very reassuring now mm. that uh, the evidence doesn't show any sort of risk mm. to the potential um you know baby or, or offspring um as far as the mums are concerned, I think we've come a long, long way as well in terms of, you know, identifying safe medications in pregnancy. And there certainly are, and, and methotrexate, case in point, you know, definitely not a drug for a mum uh, who wants to start uh, a family uh, to, to, to be on methotrexate. So that's certainly one of the, the big no-nos. And there are a number that, you know, are, are definitely contraindicated. But a lot of the Medications that are now in routine use, including a lot of the biologic medications, appear to be very, very safe during pregnancy. As far as when is it a good time? I mean, you know, you may be familiar with the, the clinics for the juveniles with arthritis, uh, yeah. the, the so-called young adolescent clinic or the, the yard clinics. And, you know, uh, I mean, I think we have to be uh, realistic about the fact that, you know, um, a girl can get pregnant uh, you know, uh, at a much earlier age than we had traditionally yeah. thought that they would. Mm. So, you know, I think it's no harm to start that conversation in a sensitive way as early as, as you know, you, you think that they can physiologically become a mother. Yeah, on an because age appropriate. As, yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. As, as Louise said, you know, 50% of our, um, our mums are planning a pregnancy, but then 50% are unplanned. So I think we have to be realistic about that. And, uh, you know, we do have to, I think. Uh, and, and actually, it's it's no harm to, you know, have that conversation about pregnancy and at the same time have a conversation about contraception. And, you know, what, what saved contraception and what contraception would be most appropriate uh, for a young girl with, uh, you know, arthritis if, uh, if she's sexually active. You know. Another question that often comes up is that, that question around, uh, I suppose, women with arthritis having perhaps perceived difficulty conceiving um, as compared, you know, women who don't have arthritis. Mm. Mm. What would your what would your take be on that? So the, the research uh, is a little bit conflicting. Some mm. some studies have suggested there's no uh, effect on sort of potential fertility. But I think that overall, if you weigh up all the studies that we have, the evidence would suggest there is a reduced fertility associated with active 
inflammatory arthritis. So if somebody has active rheumatoid arthritis or active psoriatic arthritis, then that their fertility may be uh, reduced while the disease is active. And that is because the immune system is active and there may be components of the immune system that may actually not be conducive to conception. So, uh, or, or even not just conception, but implantation of the, the fertilized egg. So, you know, it may not be just about the fertility. It may be actually about uh, whether or not the fertilized egg is actually, you know, uh, maintained or sustained uh, in the mother's womb. So uh, the other thing is anti-inflammatories can sometimes reduce the sort of fertility uh, environment of the uh, of the, the uterus. And so, you know, the even a, an, a, a successfully fertilized egg may not get implanted. So these are mm. these are things that that actually I think uh, you know are are worth discussing and and being aware of. So and that really comes back to why we think if you're healthy when you conceive, there's more likely uh, a chance of actually achieving and sustaining a pregnancy. So I think there is a there is a slight reduced uh, fertility associated with active arthritis. Which, which again, you know, I think you know drives this this philosophy of being as well as you can be before you actually embark on the pregnancy. Mm. And some of the studies have shown that um, a longer time to pregnancy is associated with older age, um, raised disease activity, um, and duration of disease. So again, we we have to remember that the same rules of engagement are are. Um, there for women who haven't got rheumatic disease. So we know that, you know, as we get older, our fertility drops off significantly after we're 40 and certainly after 35, there is some decrease in fertility. So those rules still apply to our women with, with rheumatic disease. So, you know, some of the newer, the more recent studies have debunked that that um, theme of reduced fertility because you have arthritis. The real focus is on having good disease control. And of course, medications and treatment, you know, form very much part of that um, disease control. Um, so I'd just like to go back to that topic of medications during pregnancy, because I suppose when we look at maybe the last 10 years, this is a, a rapidly evolving space in terms of treating mm -hmm. women um, with some of the arthritis treatments during pregnancy. A lot of the a lot of the, the focus has changed. The research has um, thrown up new guidelines. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit more about that? I know we, we talked a little bit about methotrexate, but yeah, te sure. just tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, Louise is actually a co-author on the guidelines uh, yeah. for, for the British Society of Rheumatology, which we sort of adopt here as well. But um, I mean, there are a number of treatments that have been around a long time. And, and for, for that reason, we know that they're relatively safe during pregnancy. And hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil would certainly be one of those. Um, and it's a treatment that we would commonly use for patients who have mild rheumatoid arthritis or with a connective tissue disease like Sjogren's syndrome or mild uh, lupus. Uh, and then the other drug that's been around a long time is, is azathioprine or Imuran. And uh, again, that uh, was one of the first drugs used to um, stop um, organ transplant rejection. So mainly kidney transplants uh, were, were uh, patients with kidney transplants were given Imuran to stop rejection. So we've got a long, uh, if you like, history of actually looking at the safety of Imuran during pregnancy. And, and it looks like it's very safe from, from the data over the last sort of 60 years or whatever. So, so there are two, uh, if you like, conventional DMARDs that have been around for a long time. And, and therefore, we're, we're quite comfortable that the risks associated with them are very low. The uh, more recent uh, medications, the sort of particularly the biologic medications, um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of experience with those now over about 22 years. And certainly most of that uh, data that's been captured uh, is, is from uh, cases, if you like, case studies where patients have been taking the medication while they've got pregnant. And uh, it looks like they are relatively safe that there's very few complications associated with those medications and uh louise do you want to say a little bit more detail about the guidelines in terms of yeah well the guidelines are available for anybody to look up which is is super so if anybody just wants to um google 
BSR pregnancy guidelines, they pop, you know, they can read them for themselves. So this was a systematic review of the literature. It took quite some time to do, and there are an update from the 2016 guidelines. So they are available for everybody. And I actually share them with patients, um, you know, during consultation. Mm -hmm. So they have the information that we have. Um, but I suppose in relation to the biologics, there's quite a lot of evidence um, about their use now in pregnancy. And I suppose, again, the, the focus and the shift in the last few years has been on the maintenance of good disease control to ensure best outcome for mom and baby. So there are times, and you know, we have certainly seen this in our clinic, where patients may need um, a management of their with, with their TNF inhibitor during pregnancy, the whole way through pregnancy. Um, but then there are women who can come off their medication during pregnancy. But again, that is in consultation with. Um, you, you know, or any with guidance from us so that, you know, if there's any flare of disease that we can switch back on to medication. So just because you're on a medication, because we know that 50 percent, again, using that 50 percent number again of women um, in the main will have good disease control during pregnancy and they will have a uh, pregnancy induced remission. So there may be opportunities to come off medications and we sort of tend to monitor. We, we, we do monitor for that. And, you know, if a woman wishes to try and reduce her medication or come off her medication, that can be facilitated. But again, with the with the um, improviser that they may need to restart their medication if there's any sign of disease activity. And that would be a common practice of um, how we manage patients during the mm -hmm. clinic. Um, so it's, it's, there's, a, there's a very much personal choice, yes. obviously, um, and, and there's whatever somebody's comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine somebody might be very anxious about their disease becoming active during pregnancy. But then someone else might be very anxious about staying on the treatment. Yeah. And so it's how you manage that sort of conflict, if you mm -hmm. like. And so we try, what we try and do is we sort of say, well, what are the risks and the benefits? So obviously, the, the you know, the risks are, are you know, uh, I guess up until now have been very much unknown uh, in terms of medications. And that was always a, a, a source of anxiety. But now we have a lot more information about the risks and, and I think that's what the guidelines speak to really. And, and most of the treatments that we use, uh, the risk is very low associated with those treatments. But then the benefit of maintaining good disease control is, is also got to be taken into account. And so it's weighing up the risks mm -hmm. of the treatment with the benefit uh, of, of actually maintaining mm -hmm. control. And it, I think in you know, many, many cases, uh, the risks are low uh, of, my, of continuing with treatment uh, and the benefits are high. And, and that's the mm -hmm. way we would look mm -hmm. at it in a sense. But, you know, I, we, we can look at an individual and say, well, if they've got very good disease control for a long time before they get pregnant um, and, you know, maybe they would take their medication less regularly, uh, we could say, well, you know, look, maybe that's the sort of case where you would, if they want to stop, they could stop, mm. as Louise says, and that's a personal choice mm. on the proviso that, you know, we, we keep a close eye on them. And if the disease flares, then we can actually uh, re, re, recommence uh, treatment at that stage. So it's a good example of sort of shared decision making. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, women at the heart of the decision making. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do the, do the current guidelines um, also... I suppose reflect some of the newer treatments that have become mm. available in recent mm. years, something you know, like the jack inhibitors, for example. Yeah. So we don't have a lot of evidence in relation to the jack inhibitors because they're not around a long, a yeah. long time. So, and again, this is where we were with um, the TNF inhibitors. Yes. You know, twenty years ago, so everybody had to stop their TNF inhibitor if they were contemplating pregnancy. So again, there isn't a whole lot of evidence, and when there isn't a whole lot of evidence, the advice is, you know, to avoid them during pregnancy. Okay. Um, Louise, I'm just going to go back to something you mentioned there as well about pregnancy induced remission, mm. because I know that's something, again, that we would get a lot of queries on. Mm. Um, uh, sometimes people enter into this journey, you know, assuming that mm -hmm. their symptoms are going to go away. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about that? You know, is it true that women who have arthritis sometimes see a reduction in their Absolutely. symptoms or in fact go into remission? You know, is there research around what, yeah. what, what percentages? I, I know that's a question we Again, often get asked. Yeah, the disease group that is most studied in relation to this would be rheumatoid arthritis. So we um, know that 50% of our women with a, a rheumatoid arthritis will have 
um, good disease control or go into a pregnancy induced remission. And again, the key, I suppose, then is while we continue to monitor them during pregnancy, we are very careful to um, keep a very close eye on them in the postpartum period because, you know, it is likely and the literature would support this that um, women might um, experience some degree of disease after their baby is born. So and do we know why? Do we know why women, why people, why pe women go into remission it's, during pregnancy? Th there's lots of theories, mm. but there's nothing at the moment. No Just, definite. There's no, no yeah. definite. Yeah. So a lot of work uh, in the early days. There was a lot of work around, you know, um, the level of um, of the. Uh, hormones, so particularly estrogen and progesterone, um, and even uh, and I've actually that one one of the groups that did a lot of the work was the um, was the uh, British Society uh, for Rheumatology Epidemiology Unit in Manchester, uh, which is um, headed up now by a number of very good Irish rheumatologists, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, so they did they did a lot of work and, and they had a lot of patients, so big numbers of patients, but they couldn't get any clear cut answers. Mm. Uh, one of the theories is that because the, the levels of progesterone are higher during pregnancy, that this is perhaps, you know, a, a, a associated with a higher uh, disease remission. Um, and uh, but you know, th there, there could be there could be a number of cause. I mean, it's, it's the same question is why do women get rheumatoid arthritis more mm. than more than men? Or, why, you know, why have a proportion mm. uh, females, females more than males uh, actually get uh, rheumatoid arthritis? But it, there's no definitive, uh, I guess, mm. evidence to suggest that the hormone levels or changes in hormones are responsible. And I know, obviously, the postpartum period as well is mm. a really important part. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes focus on the yes, the, the baby, the baby, and the pregnancy mm. journey, and the baby mm. being the end of it. But obviously, mm. there's a, a you know um, a journey to be followed after. Yeah, the absolutely. Baby is born. And this is, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Maybe that's an area of you know a, an area of great interest, um, and it's an area that we sp certainly their care is finished in the obstetric services. So at, at that stage, women are usually coming back to their rheumatology services wherever that may be. And it's uh, certainly an area that um, women need to be monitored and maybe um, educated about, about, you know, watching out for, for you know, the, the increase in, in disease activity or, or, or disease flare. But um, it's a so during pregnancy, you know, while we are very much focused, you know, on the delivery of, of, of a healthy baby and at a healthy birth weight um, and born at term, you know, once the baby is delivered, um, we can have there is that opportunity, I suppose, to bring in other members of the multidisciplinary team. So our physiotherapy colleagues, our occupational therapy colleagues who can support women in uh, their man managing and caring for their baby. Um, and, uh, you know, having that early appointment back with um, their uh, rheumatology team to observe and watch out for for disease flare. So I think the, the message certainly is, I think, getting out to women now sort of to make sure that they have an appointment to get back to their rheumatology team quite early. And, and my experience certainly from the clinic is, you know, when we, when we meet women coming from different services, they go, oh, you know, no, I'm getting back to see my rheumatologist in six weeks after I've delivered. So that really is, would be a key message for women to uh, make sure that they get back to their rheumatology team to be seen. Because we certainly would see a lot of um, disease flare of, of varying degrees. You know, it might be a mild disease flare or it might be the other end as a severe disease flare. But again, support is required. It's also time, I think, which, uh, you know, when, when the, again, the mum is focused on the baby and once the baby's born, mm. the focus goes on the baby and everybody else sort of is looking at the baby. And not looking at the mum, mm. so it's an anxious time for mums anyway, mm. and and they sometimes feel a little bit neglected. I think, uh, you know, because everybody's focusing on the baby. So, you know, and I, I think that that anxiety uh, can certainly, you know, uh, impact on their arthritis. And you know, they they have feelings, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, where their emotions are changing on a on a rapid basis, you know, because of the changes in the hormones once the baby's born as well. So. I think it's an important time mm. that 
a certain focus is, is given to the mum. And I think the multidisciplinary team are sort mm. of particularly, uh, I think, um, well suited to, to mm. provide that sort of support, actually, at that time. Another question that, that we're often asked is about the whole area of breastfeeding. And obviously, you know, it's it's something that an area that's very much promoted in Ireland now. Absolutely. We have traditionally quite low rates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, will somebody with arthritis um, be able to breastfeed their baby? Absolutely. When we did a, a, a survey of our own service, we found that only 26 percent of our patients were breastfeeding. So we need to certainly to look at that now. I think the rate in Ireland at the moment is around the late 50s, 55 percent. So we have low breastfeeding rates, as you say, but certainly in rheumatology, our rates are, are in on the floor. So, again, women do have this preconceived idea and they come to us with this preconceived idea that they can't they can't breastfeed while on their, you know, their medications. Um, however, again, the guidelines certainly support the use of uh, breastfeeding, especially around the TNF inhibitors and um, Plaquenil, um, any of the, the monoclonal antibodies, Doug, is, mm. the, the advice is absolutely continue with breastfeeding or certainly, you know, attempt breastfeeding. There, because you're on a medication, more than likely, it doesn't mean that you, you're not going to be able to breastfeed. But again, that's a really important discussion. Mm. And that discussion needs to happen sort of in the first and second trimester so that people are getting that that idea into their head. Yes, it is OK to breastfeed and sort of dispel that myth about OK, I can't breastfeed because I'm on medication. And usually women um, certainly I've noticed certainly in the last year that, um, I'll, you know, I, there has been a greater uptake in breastfeeding. I think it's worth saying as well that uh, while, you know, we, we, we don't see as many patients nowadays who, uh, you know, got a lot of joint damage mm. uh, because people are starting treatments earlier and earlier. Uh, but we, we have had a, a small number of young girls who, again, presented with juvenile arthritis who had a lot of joint damage because their arthritis when they were kids wasn't really treated as well as it could have been or as well as it would have been today. Uh, and interestingly, just what, you know, from my own observation, uh, is that, you know, even with quite severe arthritis, that from a physical point of view, these young mums have, have been very able mm. uh, to manage the baby, whether it's breastfeeding or whether it's changing or, you know, uh, just managing the baby around the house. You know, um, so my message would be that, you know, even if you have bad arthritis, you know, that y y you will, you, you know, will often be very capable and that it will be feasible, you know, to actually um, cope with the baby after the baby's born and including breastfeeding. Yeah, I mean, that was my next question was about that, that whole concern that women might have about their ability maybe to hold their baby, mm -hmm. lift their baby, carry their baby, you know. Babies are very mm. dependent yep. on their on their parents. Um, you know, do you have any tips about, uh, you know, how a person might address those concerns and uh, I suppose maybe put a plan in place? Yeah. Or? Well, uh, certainly w working with my physiotherapy colleagues, my occupational therapy colleagues, we tend to refer patients early on in their pregnancy. Ideally, you know, it would be a part of the preconception plan, but we're not there yet. But to work on upper body strength to be well and as fit as possible because the upper body, with all that care that happens sort of from the upper body, mm. sort of holding a baby, leaning into cots, mm. it really comes from the shoulders, the wrists, the hands, the small joints, the hands get sore. And certainly our occupational therapy colleagues do um, a hand assessments, which are very, very helpful to um, support women to sort of lift their baby safely and um, um, be able to do all those activities of, you know, uh, self caring for their baby those small poppers on baby grows, which sort of women sort of cringe about and mm -hmm. um, sort of th there's ways around those. So I think a visit certainly to an occupational therapist um, a, within their service mm -hmm. or an occupational therapist early on in pregnancy to prepare for the postpartum piece. Sometimes it's a little bit, it's too late really yes. once the baby is delivered because all that groundwork could have been worked on early on in yeah, the pregnancy. And, uh, concerns and fears of aid mm. yeah. in advance. And actually, if you have a peep, because I had to look at the, um, uh, the HSE website, and there is a lovely good website um, uh, developed by the HSE looking at preparing for pregnancy. And all the guidelines that are there and all the recommendations still, you know, 
um, uh, they talk about exercise. They talk about the importance of being well. Um, so again, those same rules still apply for all women. With, they're all yeah. applicable. Yeah. Actually, just on, on exercise, I mean, obviously, we know that physical activity mm. and exercise is one of the most important things a person can do when they're living with arthritis. Um, what, what advice would you have for somebody who's pregnant, um, you know, in terms of their, their levels of exercise or physical activity and even in that postpartum period as well? Well, our obstetricians yes. often say <laughs> that uh, that pregnancy is not a disease. Well, yes. <laughs> so, you know, they, they should be able to, to exercise uh, and, and continue exercising uh, really as normal, you know. And so the more exercise you can take, the better. And it very much, I think the rate limiting step is often, you know, your energy or, you know, how, how yeah. well you feel. So if your arthritis is well controlled and you're feeling well, then there's no reason why you uh, you can't take as much exercise as, as you actually feel up to, mm. you know. And certainly that's the advice from Professor McAuliffe. You know, right. if you're if you are walking, if you're, you know, whatever your exercise is pre-pregnancy, you should be able to continue it during pregnancy. Yeah. What's, so that sort of keep going. Yeah. And I would, I would recommend also, I mean, if they're not doing something like yoga or Pilates, that, that you know, f just from the stretching point of view and particularly maintaining your posture, mm. you know, again, it comes back to lifting a baby mm. or, you know, um, managing breastfeeding, whatever, you know, to, to make sure that your posture is in good condition. Good core strength. Yeah, mm. good core strength. And there's also, um, uh, there's, there's a, program which is i think online uh called mummy mot uh for all new mums uh but it's also i think um would be would be very much applicable to uh, mums with arthritis as well and it's very much around core strength and mm -hmm. pilates uh and physio uh you know to try and actually make sure you're in the best condition to have your baby mm. and once you've had your baby make sure that you're in good condition and, and get back to a sort of if you like a normal mm. uh, normal muscle health uh, you know because we often you know we focus on the joints with arthritis but you know the muscles are really important at keeping mm. those joints in place mm. and uh, making sure they're strong and remember I suppose there's no it can never be too late to exercise so if you've never exercised and find yourself pregnant you know certainly there's certainly exercises you can do Seek advice maybe from um, your physiotherapist about where to go and remind everybody that you attend. If you're attending new classes, just remind them that you're pregnant. Mm. So it's never too late. Exercise cannot be overemphasized. It's as important as medication. Mm, isn't absolutely. It? Yeah. My last question today is one I'm sure you get asked all the time. If mom or indeed dad um, have arthritis, how likely is it that their disease um, will be passed on to their baby? Yes, that is it. That's a, co a common question. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think most people are aware that there is some genetic element to the um, etiology or the, the 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 actual process of arthritis. And some art some forms of arthritis are more sort of, you know, hereditary than others. Um, but it would be unusual, I would say, for a direct um transmission of arthritis so if we if we i guess you know the, the most common uh inflammatory form of arthritis again as louise mentioned is rheumatoid arthritis so it'd be very uncommon for a uh, a, a a child uh, of a mother with rheumatoid arthritis to develop that arthritis certainly early on in age you know we we do see uh you know examples whereby a child may develop rheumatoid arthritis at the same time as their mother developed rheumatoid arthritis. So sometimes, for instance, the mum developed rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 30, then that child may be at some risk of developing at that stage as well. But it, I say it was the, it'd be the exception rather than the rule. Um, in terms of osteoarthritis, it's probably much more hereditable than, than rheumatoid arthritis. But again, that tends to be at a much a, a much more advanced age, so older age group. Uh, and the, the average onset of, of osteoarthritis would be in sort of 50s and 60s. So um, I would say, look, you know, autoimmune diseases in general run in families, but tr direct transmission from mother to child is, is uncommon. 
it's more likely that you might know another member of the family, maybe a cousin or an aunt or an uncle, who also has arthritis. And there's other factors at play oh, in absolutely. the development of the disease. Absolutely. Mm. And if you think of environmental factors, mm. so, you know, uh, smoking, as mm -hmm. we know now, is probably by far and away the strongest environmental risk factor. Uh, and there may be other risk factors, such as certain infections that might trigger uh, arthritis as well. So in, in general, I think I'd reassure people that there is a, a very low risk of a child developing arthritis to, to a mum or a dad with arthritis. Probably one of the most common questions we get. However, it's I haven't met anybody yet who has not decided to go on and plan their family because mm. of um, the risk of their child, you know, because the risk is so small. It's possible, but it's not probable. Yeah. Not it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's, it's absolutely. And lots of things are possibilities. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But I think it's a low possibility. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the key issue. Yeah. yeah. And women don't not plan their family because yeah, of the because very of it, yeah. low risks. And on that positive and reassuring note, um, I will thank my guest today, uh, Professor Doug Beal and Louise Moore. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you for having us, us today. Thank Thanks very much. That's all from this episode of Inflammation Nation. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Stitcher, or as they always say, wherever you get your podcasts. For further information about arthritis, you can visit our website, arthritisireland.ie, or contact our helpline on 0818 252 846. See you next time. Inflammation Nation is supported by Pfizer. <laughs>